<laughs> okay, that's all. Right. Are you ready? Yeah. What do you want? Yeah. 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 Um, welcome, welcome. Uh, I'm Alicia Rigoni. I'm a senior and a um, communications major, obviously. Um, I'm here to introduce you to, hope I can do this, to uh, a mentor and a very good friend of mine, Jeremy, I'm so sorry. <laughs> he's been with me for four years and he's guided me through a lot of different things and he's always been there for all of us. I think we can all test. He's one of our favorite professors, one of mine I know for sure. I'm sure you all agree with that. Um, we're here to hear his one last rant as he leaves us to go to uh, Grand Rapids Community College. So our loss is their gain, and I hope that they appreciate him as much as I know that I do and I know that you all do. So I'm going to stop blabbing and crying, and I'm going to let him take over and give to us his last rant. So everyone, please. So, <laughs> uh, first of all, I wanted to, I just wanted to thank Waterboard for inviting me to do this, uh, giving me the opportunity to speak one last time. It's, uh, it's an honor to be asked to do this and to know that, that people appreciate the, the things that you do. And to hear, hear Alicia, I have to compose myself a little bit now. Um, I'm a little bit of a crier, so uh, it'll be okay. Uh, but thank you for inviting me to come in. It really does mean a lot to me to be able to have the opportunity to do this. And in terms of, of sort of what I'm going to talk about today, I've kind of several people have asked me about what do you want to talk about? And I've given people this really sort of nebulous answer that I'm going to talk about what it means to live a life that matters. Um, and so I'll explain that a little more in a couple minutes. But the first thing I sort of wanted to just to mention is that uh, I am not, I don't have a terminal illness. So, <laughs> how many of you have read the last lecture in the book or seen the YouTube video of Randy Pausch? Um, so Randy Pausch was a computer science <coughs> professor who delivered a last lecture in 2007 at Carnegie Mellon University where he had been diagnosed with terminal cancer and had three to six months to live. And so, when Pausch developed, developed and delivered his last lecture, he developed it as a kind of last way of telling his kids the lessons that he wouldn't be able to teach them in life. And so the good thing is that I am not terminally ill, but, <laughs> but having said that, this is more than just a rhetorical exercise for me. And as Alicia said, and as I think most of you know at this point, I am leaving Albion, and so this really is my last lecture, and when I look back over the past several years, I have been a teacher in some institution of higher education for the last 12 years, and it's really the only thing that I have known, knowing that every day I have the opportunity to be able to get up and to go into a classroom and to help people become thinkers and to find themselves. Um, and to be, like Alicia said, a, a mentor and an advisor. And now that's, that's ending. And so when I started to think about what do I really want to talk about, I knew I didn't want to talk about theory. I knew I didn't want to talk about research. You know, you'll, you'll, <laughs> you'll get plenty of that when I'm gone. And so in terms of kind of thinking about what I did want to, want to talk about, I realized that one of the things that's made my job and my life meaningful is... I like teaching, but it's the people and the advising that really has made this a rewarding experience for me and just being able to work with people. And so I sort of thought about what are some of the things that I would want my advisees to know, knowing that they're not going to get another opportunity to sit down in my office and kind of work through things. And so this is sort of one last giant kind of group advising appointment in some respects. And in terms of, of sort of this idea of living a life that matters, I, I'm not trying to profess that I have all the answers and that I, 
know the secrets of life. And in a lot of ways, I'm no different than you guys are. And in fact, 15 years ago, I was sitting right where you are right now, finishing up my undergraduate education, <coughs> trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, thinking I knew everything. I <laughs> didn't realize yet that I didn't. And so it's not that I have all the answers in the universe, but the one thing I do have that you don't have is a 15-year head start. So what I wanted to talk about today was sort of what I've learned in that 15-year head start about the things that really matter in life and about what it really means to, to live a life that has some significance to it. So in terms of topics, I knew that I, I could talk about things like working hard or being optimistic and always giving your all. And those things are important. And then I believe in, in those things. Well, some of you probably argue the optimism point, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm an all-in kind of person. That's my personality. And so it's sort of an all-or-nothing thing with me. And I think that's important. To, to really throw yourself into something. Anything worth doing is worth doing with all you've got. But those are lessons that you've probably already learned and things that you already know. And so when I really started trying to think about what is it that does make life matter? What is it that makes life significant? I actually kind of parked on a question that those of you that have taken calm theory have seen before. Two words. Any ideas what it is? So what? So, what? <laughs> so, in terms of thinking about a life of significance and a life that matters, I came back to this question, so what? Now, some of you already have heard the story behind so what. So th this phrase is something that's had a significant impact on my life. And just to kind of fill the rest of you in, when I was a master's student at Ohio State, I went in for my proposal defense for my master's thesis, Groans and the Ohio State. Um, and... It's an interesting experience when you come out of undergrad, you think you know everything, you go into grad school, you realize you don't know everything, you embark on this major research project, and so I have read pages and pages of articles and books, and I thought that I was pretty much a content expert in this area, because after all, I was 23 years old, and I read a couple of books, so obviously I'm an expert. So, so I went into this proposal defense with my research questions and my hypotheses, and I prepared all of this this stuff to answer content <coughs> questions. You know, oh, if they ask me about methods, this is what I'm going to say. Uh, if they want clarification on these theories, you know, I've got all these answers. I know, I know everything already. So I go in and I present my information, and I wait. And Susan Klein, who was one of my committee members at the time, sits back in the chair and she looks at me and she says, "It's clear that you know your information, and this is well written." But my one question for you is, so what? Which, of course, as a 23-year-old who knew everything, I interpreted that to mean that clearly she had been dozing off during my discussion of my hypotheses and all this stuff that I knew, because after all, I'm a content expert. So clearly, you didn't understand what I was talking about. And so I, so I clarified it, I thought, and then sort of explained my hypotheses again. And she stopped me. She said, no, 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 no. I get that. What I want to know is, so what? Why does any of this matter? And she said, I understand the what part of it. The what is the content. And those of you that are in common theory, you've heard this before, right? When you look at a theory, the what is what it says. That's the multiple choice exam information. The so what is the why does it matter component. So if you look at your own life, has this theory made a difference in the way you see things? If you look at society as a whole, has this theory actually affected social change? If you look at science, has this theory actually inspired research? So what? Why does this question matter in the grand scheme of things? And so as I was thinking about the exact topics that I wanted to talk about tonight, I kind of came back to this so what question. And I knew it was something that those of you that are comm majors would, would right away relate to, because we've talked about it so much in class. And I think that that idea of what it means to live a life that matters really comes back to the so what question. So aside from all the what that you do, your major, the amount of money that you make, the things that you accumulate, so what? 
you know, why does any of that matter? And, and I think that in, in just looking at this from sort of an advisor standpoint, I have so many people that come in my office with these grand plans and they talk about all these things that they just have to do before they graduate. And, and sometimes I just have to tell them, take a step back and breathe. You know, that's, that's, that's all well and good, but why do you think that these are the things that you need to do? You know, and, and, and when you look back 20 years, do these three minors that you think you need right now, <laughs> your two majors, your two minors, your four concentrations, and your 15 extracurriculars, is that really, is that really going to be something that you can look back on and say, that made what I did matter. So if you look at your life, beyond the what of your life, why does it matter? And, and I am only 37 years old, uh, so, so I'm not standing up here as the wise old sage that, that's looking back over a lifetime of experiences. But I have experienced a number of things in the past 15 years, and this is something that I've really thought about a lot. Why, what is it that makes your life matter? And I, I've had a lot of experiences where I've made some mistakes, I've done some things well, I've done some things not so well. And so what I want to do is pass some of that along to you so that hopefully when you leave here, you can at least start to think about what is it that makes my life matter? And beyond the kind of fast-paced what of what I'm doing, what is it that makes it matter? And what are some of the choices that I can make that could help me live a life that makes a difference. So, I have four kind of major points and then a couple little things that I'll talk about in between. There's lots of stories here. I told, I told students in my classes that if you like the Osborne tangents, basically what you're getting here is, is one long tangent. So, so the first point, the first sort of major thing that I wanted to cover is, kind of relates to the idea of Living a life that matters to you. Because the first thing you have to think about is, what do I need to do to be able to look back in 15 years, 20 years, and really feel like what I've done has mattered? And I have this one piece of advice that I've given several advisees before, maybe not in these exact terms. Do what you love to do and not what you're supposed to do. And I actually have a, a specific story that I I want to talk about with this. I did get permission from someone who's not here uh, to talk about this. So several of you know Claudia Toro, right? Uh, Claudia and Alicia are sort of my my children, really, in some respect. And that both of them have been advisees of mine since the beginning, since since sort of day one of their careers. And actually, I interviewed Claudia for a scholarship interview before she even came to Albion. And so we've sort of gone through this whole thing together. And Claudia is at the Philadelphia Center right now. And her being at the Philadelphia Center is actually a, kind of a core part of, of what I want to talk about. So this idea of doing what you love to do and not what you're supposed to do. Claudia came into my office for an advising appointment one day. And she said to me, OK, I've got all these requirements done. I've been really good about planning. I want to finish this minor, this minor, and I want to go off campus. And I don't think I can get all of that done in the time I have left. So I think I'm just not going to go off campus. And those of you that know Claudia, and several of you know Claudia really well, uh, that was an experience that I knew she wanted. That she would really get something out of. And then she studied, studied abroad in high school even, and that was one of the first things that I learned about her. And so when she comes in and she says this to me, I said, okay, well, you know, stop. <laughs> okay, let's think about this. So what are your two minors? And she told me that her two minors were religious studies and econ. No offense to the econ people in the room. But uh, so I asked Claudia, I said, why? Because those two things are sort of described from each other. So I said, why, why econ, why religious studies? And I think actually the, the pragmatist in me first says, and this, this was a lesson I learned, why religious studies? And of course what she says is, I really like religious studies classes. She said, those are the classes that I look forward to. I really enjoy them. I started taking religious studies classes, and I found myself only two classes away from a minor. So that's something I'm really passionate about. I said, OK, that, that's good. That makes sense. So why econ? And if this goes up online, and Claudia says, <coughs> so sorry, I apologize. Uh, she said, because my mom thought that I needed a business minor to help me get a job. 
because of course as a comm major, you're used to having everyone tell you that you can't get a job with a comm major. So, so I said, well, okay, that's, do you like econ? And she said, no, I hate it. I said, okay, so why are you still doing it? Well, my mom says, what do you do it? I said, I think personally, you need to go off campus. I know you want to go off campus. Um, and so we talked about it a lot, and then finally she did end up dropping the econ minor. And she's on the, the cusp of graduation. She went, went away. She's at the Philadelphia Center. Uh, you know, she has her own little website now. She's doing a great internship that she loves, and she's really getting a lot out of it. And it turned out to be the, the right thing to do. And, and I think that what happens, and I know that a lot of you can relate to this, is you feel so much pressure to achieve and to live up to this particular model that your parents or your friends or society or whatever tells you that you need to live up to, that we oftentimes will sacrifice the things we feel really passionate about so that we can follow this path that someone else has told us we need to follow. Right? That, that whole idea of doing what you're supposed to do. I mean, who decides what you're supposed to do? The reality is that at the end of the day, who do you have to answer to for your choices? Yourself. Right? You're the one that has to look in the mirror and, and, and look at yourself and, and, and make account for the choices you've made and the things you've done. And if there's something that you don't love to do and you're not passionate about and, and you don't want to do, you know, you're the one that ultimately down the road, not, not your mom, not your friends, not your significant other, you're the one that, that's going to have to live with the consequences of those decisions. And, I think that people get really hung up on this idea that I need this minor, I need this major, I need these particular things on my resume to get the life that I want. But the reality is if you're true to yourself and you follow your passions, you'll fall on your feet. And, and I've had lots of students, and I know that, that several of you are mortar board members, and I know that it takes a, a pretty high level of achievement to get into mortar board. If you're smart and you work hard and you're motivated, it doesn't matter what your major is. You'll figure it out. I had a student who had a 399 GPA, was in town going to law school, was not a good test taker. He didn't do well on the LSAT, but in the meantime, he had gotten a job working for Lutheran Social Services, found out, and he had a real passion for serving people. And what he found out in doing that was that in working with these kids, that he really felt like he could be a teacher. And he went back to Olivet, and he got a teaching certificate, and he emailed me, he came back and visited me a couple times. He emailed me at the beginning of the semester and said, hey, I'm a teacher now. And he now, after all of that, something he completely off his radar. He used to carry a copy of the US Constitution in his backpack. He was that passionate about law. But then he found this other thing, this other thing that he was passionate about, and now he's a social studies teacher. You know, you'll find your way. You're, some of you are only 19 years old. Maybe some of you are 18 years old. You have a lot of life ahead of you. So, so follow your heart, follow your passions. Do what you love to do, not what you feel like you're supposed to do. Uh, one personal example related to this, when I was in graduate school, I went to a large research intensive university like a lot of, for graduate school, like a lot of the faculty typically do. And I remember standing in Robin Nabby's office. Um, and, and I was really interested in teaching. I loved teaching. I was passionate about teaching. And I was mm, about research. <laughs> I like my research. Um, but I was really passionate about teaching. And when I was standing in her office, she looked at me and she said, you will go as far as you choose to go. She said, the only person she said, you're bright, you could be a star in this field, the only person that can stand in your way is you. And she was right. Um, and against a lot of the advice of, of people that were advisors of mine in, in grad school, I only looked at small teaching institutions. Because that's what I wanted to do. That was where I got my undergrad, was at a small teaching institution. And I'll talk about some of my mentors a little bit later, but that was what made a difference in my life was people like that at those places. And so I came to Albion. And in spite of all the hours I spent driving in here, which you guys know about, I wouldn't trade any of it for anything, the opportunities that I've had 
to work with you guys and to work with those that have come before you over the past seven and a half years. And that happened because I followed my passions and not what people were telling me, this is what you're made to do. And I said, no, it's not. So do what you love to do, not what you're supposed to do. And if that creates advising nightmares for your advisors, I can give you my new contact information and they can, <laughs> they can take it up with me. Okay. So, do what you love to do, not what you're supposed to do. That's the first thing. The second thing is live outside the box. You hear people all the time giving you advice of thinking outside the box. And thinking is fine. But the reality is, the word living is an action verb. Life, life is about doing things. Um, and it's great to think outside the box. But, but when you look at the course of history... People accomplish significant things only when they step out and they take a risk and they do something that's outside the box. And so I would encourage you to think outside the box, but the second thing I would, I would encourage you guys to do in trying to live a life that you can be proud of and that matters to other people is to live outside the box. Take risks. Do things that aren't comfortable. For those of you that know, does anyone know Michael Edmondson? I know a couple of you know Michael Edmondson. I always steal this, this line from Michael Edmondson. He's at the Philadelphia Center, and he always tells students you need to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And it's true. <clears throat> You've got to learn to step outside your comfort zone and live outside the box. Um, and in doing that, it's the only way that, that really interesting things get done. And I actually want to go back to this, an idea that's related to this. Defining moments. How many of you can identify some things that you consider to be defining moments in your life? What are some of the defining moments in your life? What makes something a defining moment in your life? See, I couldn't just stand up your answer or ask some questions eventually. Good. question everything that you believe to be true. Okay, so there are things that cause you to really re-examine things, right? To question the things you believe to be true. What about the rest of you? What, what makes something a defining moment? Accomplishing something you've been working at for a while. What did you do? I couldn't get it. Accomplishing something you've been working at for a while. Okay, all right, now that's good. Now that, and that's kind of what I expected people to say. Now I want to, I want to challenge that just a little bit. Um, when, you, when you accomplish something you've been working on for a long time, where was the really risky decision made? Is it at the end? Or is it the beginning? I found out when I was trying to prepare for this that I was really bad about taking <coughs> pictures in school. I don't even have a picture of myself at my doctoral graduation. So I was kind of thinking about that in terms of defining moments. And for a lot of people, I think that they would point to the day that I walked across the stage and my advisor draped that hood over my head and, and I became Dr. Osborne, that's a defining moment. But, but in my mind, the real defining moment, that's just kind of the culmination of a lot of other stuff. And for me, I think of defining moments as those points in time where, like Poe was talking about, <laughs> you are, that's right, uh, those points in time where you're forced to really examine everything and you have to make a choice. You're standing at a crossroads. And some of you know this and some of you don't, but I, I, I was not originally going to go to grad school at all. When I was an undergrad, I was a radio and TV major with a public relations minor, and I was set on becoming a video production person. I was going to go and edit videos together, and maybe someday I would be able to get into film, and that's what I wanted to do. And it was literally the spring semester of my senior year in college, procrastinating, Senior senior year, spring semester, my advisor, John Lettingham, was standing in his office, and he says to me, Jeremy, have you thought about going to grad school? And I said, I can't afford to go to grad school, which was a cheap cop-out answer. It's a cheap way of basically saying, I don't want to think about that right now. And he said, oh, no, they'll pay for it. This is a great thing. And so, and so I went, and I decided that I would apply to the Ohio State University for a master's program in communication. And that would be the only application I would turn in. And if it worked out and they funded it, I would do it. Otherwise, I'd go get a job. And for me, the defining moment, and really it's because of that conversation in John Lettingham's office, a conversation that I doubt he even remembers having. Just like I doubt Susan Klein 
Actually, I can tell you, because I confirmed this two weeks ago, Susan Klein does not remember having that conversation with me when she told me so what. Uh, I guarantee that Lettingham doesn't remember that. But I do. Because I made a decision that day to step outside the box and take a risk. You know, I didn't know anything about grad school. Plus, I was applying late. I literally signed up for the GRE on a Tuesday and took it on a Saturday. No preparation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but but I mean that was a risk, right? And to only apply to one school, that's a that's a risk. But but that was something that was never on my radar. And so to make the decision to do that, and then two years down the road, I had never gone to school more than an hour and twenty minutes from my house. And two years down the road, finishing up my master's degree at Ohio State, I made one visit to the University of Arizona, which was three thousand miles, give or take, away. Uh, and I remember making that decision when I was there, I'm going to do this. And I was, a, I was kind of a mama's boy, so, and a crier. <laughs> so, so that was something that was not, I mean, I wasn't itching to get out of the house. But I did it because I knew that I needed to. I, I could tell I felt that that was something I needed to do. I needed to take a risk. And so you've got to live outside the box. Those are your defining moments. Are those points in time when you're standing at a crossroads, you're forced to re-examine everything you thought you, that was true, and your stability is upset a little bit, and you make a decision to, to kind of delve into something that's completely different and foreign to you. And, and those are the things that you'll look back on later and say, that was a defining moment for me. Life is about action, it's about doing things. People that just play by the rules and follow everyone else and do what everyone else is doing, are going to end up doing what everyone else is doing. The people that are the innovators and the leaders are the people that step outside of that and are willing to take risks and take chances. So, live outside the box. Um, another thing, another couple examples of this. Last November, I had a, a comfortable position here at, at Albion. Uh, and I've been doing this for a long time, as I, as I talked about at the beginning. I, I didn't know anything besides a college classroom. And I saw a job posting for a position at, number one, a community college, which I didn't know anything about. And number two, it's an administrative position. And I looked at the job description, and there was something like 25 individual duties attached to this. And I looked at that. And the easy thing to do would have been to just close the browser window and go back to Facebook. <laughs> Because, I mean, really, right? Like, I've got a good thing going here. My, my colleagues like me. I think at least they say so to my face. Uh, and, and the students seem to like me most days, sometimes. At least those of you that showed up today, right? Uh, you know, and, and I, I'm comfortable. I'm doing the same thing I've always done. It's something that I know how to do. But to see that, there's a decision point. And I knew that it was going to take hours of preparation just to put this material together. But there was a decision point there where I decided to turn that packet in. And then along the way, for those of you that kind of know the story, they pulled the funding in the middle. I applied in November, and it was literally 11 months later before I started. So I've got this new, this new job. It's an administrative position, and it's completely outside of anything that I've done before. Um, but, but I'm happy. It's working out well. And that's, that's the kind of thing you have to do. You've got to be willing to take risks. And if you're doing what you love to do, opportunities will come up where... You know that it's a little bit outside your comfort zone, but there's that little tug that's telling you, you need to do this. And maybe for you, to kind of take this out of just my experiences, maybe for you that moment comes when you're standing in front of the rack in the off-campus study office, and you're looking at those different programs, and you're thinking, wow, it would be really interesting to study in Spain or Australia. Especially someplace like Spain or France, you're thinking, I don't, I don't know the language. And it's a risk. You're outside your comfort zone, you're away from your friends, you take time off from Audi, and you have to go through all this, this work to make sure your credits get approved and all this. But it's that moment. You can walk away, and maybe you never think of it again, or maybe you have regrets about it. But it's that, maybe that's the moment for you that changes your life. <clears throat> Down the road somewhere. Um, flying out to an interview, applying for a job that you're not sure about, 
deciding to go to graduate school instead of looking for jobs like all of your friends. You know, those are the kinds of things that are, are defining moments for you. And so kind of the, the, the measure of who you are, what sort of defines you is how you respond to those to those defining moments. And so thinking about your life, what are your defining moments? You know, what is it, what are the what are the walls of the boxes that you're living inside that you need to push against to get out of? And think about that. I, I've had students before that have up and left Michigan to move to LA to pursue acting careers. You know, you'll hear a lot of people that will tell you that's stupid. <laughs> but if that's what you love and you feel compelled to do it, you're young, you know, give it a shot. Live outside the box. What are the boxes that are holding you in? And what do you need to do to push out of them? So First thing, do what you love, not what you're supposed to do. Second thing, live outside the box. The third thing, and this is the one that I probably struggled the most with myself, and I, this will require some explanation, is simply be present. I think someone once said that the first part of succeeding in anything is simply showing up. Any of you done P90X before? Tony Horton, annoying, he says, just keep showing up, push and play. Right? I mean, there's something to that, right? You've got to be there. You've got, to, you've got to show up. And I think one of the things that, that we're really bad about in our society is really appreciating every moment. And I think there's three mistakes that we tend to make. Either we spend all of our time dwelling on the past, we spend all of our time planning for the future, or we spend all of our time on Facebook where we're not really paying attention to what's going on. I mean, think about that. How many of you, you don't have to put your hands up. You can if you want. I'm leaving soon, so I'm not going to rat you out. Uh, how many of you have ever been on Facebook in the middle of a lecture? I was sitting next to someone today in class, some of you were in class in PR, and he's sitting there on Twitter and Facebook and the middle of doing presentations. I'm like, come on, really? What are you doing? You know? When you're doing that, your mind is somewhere else. Right? You're, you're not present in the moment. Every single moment that you get in your life is a unique moment, you can't get it back. So what are you doing with those moments? I mean, that's the question, right? What are you doing with those moments? And one of the most compelling, compelling stories that I can give on this, and this is really something that only has become clear to me recently. I've had the luxury over the past seven years of always having one day a week where I was at home. Now, for those of you that don't know, I've got two kids, Alexander and Jonah. Alexander's five and Jonah's two. And the one thing that I had with Alexandra that I know is really rare is that I always knew that I had one day when I was home watching her when she was not in kindergarten. And so, you know, my, my wife was at work, and I had that one day a week where I knew that it was sort of daddy and Alexandra time. And I really took that for granted. Badly. Um, and, and I'm very much a to-do list person? Do we have to-do list people in here? How many of you have ever completed a to-do list? If you're a real to-do list person, you've never completed a to-do list. <laughs> <laughs> because they just keep growing, don't they? And so you get this mindset of, if I, just, if I just take one more hour, I'll finish this list, and then I'll live my life. But the problem is that life is what happens when we're planning for other stuff. And the problem that I had when, when Alexander was at home is I would be checking emails all day, and I would sit her down. This is terrible parenting, but uh, <laughs> don't do this. I would sit her down in front of the TV, and I would turn on Dora or something, and then I would go sit at my desk, and I would respond to student emails, and I would try to get grading done. In the back of my head, I would always be thinking, if I can just finish these last three papers, then... I'll go spend time with my daughter. And you know what happens when you're a to-do list person? Is you finish those two papers, and then another email comes in. Or there's more papers, and there's always something. And it's, it's a priority thing. You know, when your mindset is that this is the priority, and this is something I'll attend to later, you don't get to this. And, and I will say that I, I did have a lot of time where, where I got to be outside with my daughter. I remember pushing her on the swing for hours. 
um, and crawling up in the top of the, the swing set. And she would, she had a little steering wheel and she would pretend that we were on a boat and she was taking me places. But there were a lot of hours that I missed out on because I always thought I'd have time later. And now that Jonah is, uh, well, he's two, and this year I had committed myself to making sure that when I was there with him, that I was all there, that I was present, and that I really was present in the moment with him. And then a month into the semester, you know, things change. <laughs> and so now I can't get that back. And so when, when you're sitting somewhere and you're zoned out, I remember my daughter has done every activity you can think of in five years. She's done ballet twice, she's done gymnastics, she's done soccer. And the thing that I find really disturbing is I would go, I didn't get to pick my daughter up from gymnastics very often because I'm an hour and a half away. And when I did get to go, you would sit there and these kids are out there doing their gymnastics and the parents are sitting in the waiting room with their smartphones up. And so you don't get that time back with your kids. You know, your, your kid's only going to be out there on that mat. This day, this moment that's happening right now, in fact, the time that you're sitting here right now, this is only going to happen once. You know, so what are you doing with that? And they're on there, they're playing solitaire, they're on Facebook. You know, they're not present in what's actually happening in the moment. And so, so be present. You know, the, the first two things kind of have to do with living a life that matters to yourself. But think about what it means to live a life that matters to the people around you. You know, how many of you, well, you don't have to answer this, but uh, you go into a, an appointment with a professor and they're sitting there and they're typing on their computer. I mean, how does that make you feel? So think about how that makes professors feel or your roommates or your friends when they come in and say, I'm having a really tough time right now. Can I talk to you? Oh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, what's on your mind? You know, be present. Enough. This is getting a little preachy, but... Uh, <laughs> But I, I'm, I'm passionate about this because it's something that I really feel like I've kind of screwed up. So, so be present in the moment and, and know that what you've got is limited. And I said that I'm not, I don't have a terminal illness like Randy Pausch did. Uh, but that hasn't prevented me from understanding that those moments mean something. You know? And so I, I've tried to, to be better about really being present, taking time with my kids. Um, and trying to really kind of suck that up. And that's what you've got to do. Suck every drop you can out of every moment you get because you don't get them back. Okay, to shift things to something more like part of you. <laughs> the next thing, of course, this isn't going to surprise any of you. It's all about relationships. <laughs> Interestingly enough, I'm not talking about need fulfillment today. <laughs> it's all about relationships. I remember... I'll start with a simple story about this. If you're thinking about kind of the, the worth of your life and who judges that, when you ask the so what question, has your life mattered to who? So, um, when I was in high school, and I graduated from high school, I was nerdy, valedictorian, kid with an attitude problem that all the teachers hated. Uh, really? I was that way in elementary school, too. I was convinced in elementary school I knew more than my teachers. And if I could still mad at my second grade teacher for marking something wrong once, where she called me a liar and said that this thing I said was a two is not a two, because it was a slightly different looking two. <laughs> Focus. Right. So when I finally graduated from high school, so I had a little bit of an attitude problem. I remember, I don't know why this sticks out of my mind, and I don't, want you, I don't want you to get the idea that I was like a computer nerd kid locked in the basement or something that had no friends. I played football, I had friends. <laughs> but I remember on graduation day, I got up, I gave my valedictorian speech, it's hot out, we're sitting on the football field, I thought I was special. <laughs> The whole thing ends, and there's that big moment where everyone stands up, and they're cheering, and everyone throws their hats, and they're all hugging, and I realized that at that moment, that they were all cheering and hugging, and I was standing there. It's like, and it was one of those weird kind of denim moments where you feel like you've taken a step back from yourself, 
and you're looking down on this, and it's like, hey, who's the kid that nobody's talking to? <laughs> And at the time, of course, at the time I was young and I was stupid, and so my 18-year-old brain just thought, these people are not worth my time. Anyway, <laughs> I'm reformed-ish. <laughs> but, but it kind of, in hindsight, looking at that, you think about, you know, all these things that you thought were important, right? All those, those like, you're the president of National Honor Society or whatever. I mean, maybe that helps you get into college, maybe that helps you get a scholarship. But at the end of the day, you know, it's about people. It, it's about the relationships in your life. The, the reality is that if you, that, that BMW that you, that you work so hard for, that penthouse apartment in Manhattan, you know, when, when, you, when you're hurting and you lose someone, that's not a shoulder to cry on. They don't care. You know, uh, when, when, something, when something good happens in your life, it's It's people. That, that matter, and, and you can be you can be in the the most beautiful place on earth. You can be you can be surrounded with the most lavish things that money can buy. You can achieve everything there is to achieve in your career, and, and you can't take it with you, right? Now, not to fall back on cliches, I'm trying to avoid that. But I was talking to a grad student at the National Communication Association conference, and we were talking about the importance of family and putting family first in things. And she said something that I thought was was actually really compelling. And she said to me, you can't put your CV on your tombstone. Which technically you could, but <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who don't know, an academic to the faculty of up because they don't know what a CV is. Uh, your CV would be your curriculum vita, which is sort of a, a a gigantic resume that faculty keep that lists all the publications you've done, all the invited lectures, and all those things. And she's right. You can have all of those things in the world, but you can't, that's not what goes on your tombstone, it's not what people remember you for. And so, you've gotta be aware of the relationships that you have. And, and I, I looked all over for a picture and I could not find a picture. One of the most influential people that I worked with when I was an undergrad was a professor by the name of Steve Esposito. And Steve Esposito was my TV professor when I was in school. Esposito had given up a successful career in sports broadcasting to go back to school and get a PhD in the evenings and then go teach at Capital University. And when I was in school, he was there all the time. He cared so much about us as students and about our learning and about our development. He would stick his neck out to get us internships. He would help me with editing. He would critique projects. And he was always there. And you can imagine, he was a talker. So you can imagine what conversations between the two of us were like. <laughs> it's like, hey, I just have a quick question two hours later. <laughs> but he, he genuinely invested in people, and this is a little bit depressing, but uh, I don't know what all the death references are. But um, I went back, I had the opportunity to go back to Capitol in 2005 and teach for a year. And at that time, Esposito had been diagnosed with cancer. He was 45 years old. And in the time that I was there, the one year that I was there, he passed away. And the students at that point put together a dedication CD for him. I watched it for the first time last week because I couldn't do it. And it's one of those things where, you know, thinking of myself as a, as a professor and what I aspire to be like, you know, I know the difference that he made, not just in my life, but in the lives of other people, because there's an hour of footage of people talking about it. And, you know, that's what, it, that's what it's really about, all about. It's not because he taught great things in the classroom. It wasn't about content. You know, it was about the time he took outside the classroom because he actually cared about us. And he invested in us. And for him, it was about the...